Well, good morning. Good morning. Okay. And what a beautiful day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Brother Eli, if you would collect the offering. church 
and built bare quarry pile, but when it gets down to the end of the day, we're also growing the kingdom of God. That's where it counts as heaven. Now, we're going to start looking at the church in this present age for this week and next week. And we're going to be taking our main verses from 2 Timothy 3.1. If someone would please read that. 2 Timothy 3.1. And then we'll also read from 2 Thessalonians 2.3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And what about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3? Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. But that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Yep, son of perdition. So. How many of us realize that we are living in the last days? We are living in the end times. And we are in a church age like no other. We are not back with the apostles under the Roman Empire facing persecution like they were. We, don't, we are not facing all this exact same stuff that they were. We are not in the Middle Ages with Catholicism where Luther is starting to emerge on the scene and say, hey, this is not the way what the Bible is saying, but we need to go back to the Bible. And we don't see this great reformation. But we are living in a time like no other. And they realize that they were living in the end times. But the more that we live, the more we can see Revelation and Daniel slowly coming into fruition, coming, slowly coming into place more and more. When we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, we're not to the point where the man of sin has been revealed. The man of sin being the Antichrist. If he's out there, he's not been revealed in the fashion that we would be able to sit back and say, you know what? He's of the Antichrist. He has those tendencies. The closest we've come, I would say, would be Obama. Not saying he was the Antichrist, but just the way that he spoke and he could get people influenced. Because you realize that when it comes to the Antichrist, there's the spirit of Antichrist behind him. And you can trace the spirit of Antichrist. He's in the world, but the Antichrist is a man. So the spirit of Antichrist is out there. That spirit that opposes Christ. And we can see that even in Hitler and Napoleon. When you go back to World War II, people were mesmerized by the way that Hitler spoke. What was that? That was the spirit of Antichrist influencing those around him. He gave him that oratory spit up. Yeah, it doesn't mean that Hitler was the Antichrist, but we can see aspects of the spirit of Antichrist rising up and being used through Hitler. But the man, the man of sin, the Antichrist, the one who's going to stand up in the middle of the temple and declare himself God, the one who the false prophet is going to speak to the image and tell it to speak. The man that's going to receive the deadly wound like unto death. As far as we know, he's not been revealed yet. We have not seen him. Does not mean that he may not already be in the political arena, but he's not been revealed as the man of sin. But where we are at in the church world is we are in the great falling away. People are not flocking to church like they used to years and years and years ago. If we go back to the 50s and probably even the 60s, what was the center of the community? Or even the 1800s? It was the church. The town, and when you build a town, you build your church, and then the town sprung up around it. Because the church was where all the activities took place, anything big happened, it happened at the church. But we are no longer living in a time like that. People are off going every which way they want, and the church is no longer the center of the community. And we are living in a day and age where people don't flock to church. But we see that great falling away. And even when it comes to the church of God, more specifically, when I say the church of God, I mean those that are living right, those that are living holy, those that are keeping their eyes on the eastern sky, waiting for Jesus Christ to come at any moment. There's a greater, num uh, greater less number of those than those that are actually in the church. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But we are in the day and age where we are in the great fallen away. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, the Greek word for the, a falling away 
is apostia. Well, what word in the English does that bring to mind? It's not that far from it. Apostasy. Apostasy. And what is apostasy? That which is not those things of God. It is abstrained from the truth. It is false teaching. It is false doctrine. Can we truly say that that is the day and age that we are living in? We are living in a day of great apostasy, a great a falling away from the truth. Uh, Sister Beth was telling me about an article, I think it was by the Washington Post. I couldn't locate it. But what happened at 9-11 after the towers came down, after the Pentagon was hit? Where did everybody flock to? They flocked to church. Why? Because they needed something. There was something missing. If something great, such a great catastrophe, catastrophe happened, well, how do I know where I'm going to go? But what happened as months went on? They stopped going. You know the reason they stopped going? Because they said they went to church, but the reason the majority of them left was there was nothing there for them. You know, what a sad day for the church. And what a sad day and age. We are living in a day and age where people who are looking for something, there was a point in time where people were truly looking for something. And the church didn't have it. Why is that? Because the church isn't where she's supposed to be. The church is far from where she's supposed to be. We are in the great falling away. We are in the day of apostasy. Where we are no longer teaching the teachings of, teachings of God, but we are teaching the doctrines of man. We are living in the day and age where pastors and ministers are trying to help people through earthly means. And they really are making the church a mockery because the news media, they don't capture on the good things that the church does. They're capturing all the bad things. And realistically, there's probably a whole lot more bad out there than there is good. We've gone, for any of those of us that have gone through the church, and I realize this was before my time, but um, Jim and Faye, Tammy Faye Bay. We can look at um, was it Jimmy Swagger. People don't focus on the good people that are out there. You don't see them bragging up um, Texas. John Hagee. There's a man that, as far as I know, he's been living right all these years. He's been doing what God's told him. We've seen people get recognition, uh, maybe like, man, I'm in a complete metal ass. This is what happens when I go off the cuff. I can see them, but I can't get their name out. But Billy Graham. Billy Graham was one of those that they could not deny. But you realize that the world was watching Billy Graham. There was years and years ago that they claimed that there was a scandal going on in the Billy Graham ministries because what happened was somebody caught a picture of Billy Graham walking out of the treasury or walking back one of the big uh, back rooms with two big bags of money. You have a lot of people that size giving a lot of money. They're going to give you a large container to hold it. But that was a scandal for a while. But they never got anything on Billy Graham. The world's looking for the bad, but they don't see the good. But there's enough of the bad in the church that they don't have to look for. And it's becoming more and more rampant. We are living in a day and age. One of the most recent ones that comes to mind is one big name preacher. Big old flood in Texas. What's he doing? He's not going out to help people through, well, let's get you back on your feet. Why don't you come to church? Let's get you established. But here's a copy of my book for free. And he's driving around on his big yacht. Or we have these ministers that have these personal plans. And they're not for ministry use, but they're for their own personal use and for their own personal gain. And people, the media latches on to that, and they run with it. But what is the church of God really doing? We are living in a day and age where the church is nowhere near what she's supposed to be. And at least the majority of the church is nowhere where she's supposed to be because we are living in the age of the great falling away. We are living in an age where we are just trying to pack pews instead of trying to pack heaven. And what I mean by that, we're not trying to build the kingdom of God. We're not trying to reach out to souls that they get saved, that they don't go to a sinner's hell. 
but rather we are reaching out for, to people to let them have a good feeling is what it comes down to. And we're packed in the pews because we're preaching whatever we want, what they want to hear. There's a big name Pentecostal whose dad would be rolling over in his grave if he knew half the stuff probably that came out of the mouth of his son and daughter-in-law's mouth. But he made the statement that he never preaches on sin or hell because it leaves a negative connotation. His wife gets up during worship service and tells people that we don't worship God for God. We worship God for us because it makes us feel good. And when we feel good, then, God make, then when we're happy, God's happy. That's not what the church is all about. But that's the day and age we're living in. Where is the church of God? We are living in the end times, in the age of the great falling away and apostasies. And if you want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll probably be there for the majority of the rest of the time. Or at least referring back to there. The 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'll go ahead and read down to verse 9. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure good. Am I in the ring? What's that? Am I not in three? No, I'm in two. But we need to endure hardness as a good soldier as well, on a side note. But, okay. We'll go down to verse 7. Where are you at? I'm right here. Where are you at? <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 3, brother. Second Timothy chapter 3, and we'll read 1 through 7. <laughs> this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly will of women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to learn, come to the knowledge of the truth. So we're not going to look at all of these, but when we look at this passage, that describes the world that we're living in today. And the sad part is, it describes the church world that we're living in today. For the majority of them, I would say it probably describes the church world that we're living in today, or at least the mindset that everyone else sees. So we are living in the great falling away, and that lovers of pleasures, well, that's kept right in the church as well. We don't have to go far to see it. What's the big thing that's starting up that everybody's into right now? It involves pigskin. And people run and go back and forth. Football. <coughs> in fact, if you're on Facebook or anything, there's probably going to be some post today about football. Or if you talk to somebody, or a lot of people, somebody's probably made mention throughout the week about football. This past, even yesterday at Walmart, I got stopped by one of the, our, my own co-workers, and he wanted to tell me about the Upper Dolphin game on Friday. He wanted to talk about football. Sports are not bad, but it's gotten to the point where sports and everything else dominate what we do versus church. And it's crept into the church world. How has it crept into the church world? Because the big thing is what happens about probably the first or second week of February. And what happens on Sunday services for some churches? They show the football, the Super Bowl, in the sanctuary. Not in another portion of the church but in the sanctuary. And there are not, and football itself isn't bad, but when things take the place of God, they become an idol. But 
That's not something we want to be showing in the sanctuary because the sanctuary is basically the holy place when it comes to the tabernacle. This is where we come to worship God. This is a sacred place. Not just anything should go on. I'm not a fan of having comedians, um, anything like that as entertainment on the platform. If you want to have that in your church, do it in a separate portion of the church. If you want to do it, that's fine. But it shouldn't replace church, and it should not be in the holy place where we come and worship God. This is a sacred place. This is reverence here. But we'll put the big screen up, and we'll not only show the Super Bowl, but what comes along with the Super Bowl? Commercials. And what are those commercials advertising? Beer. Beer. Half-naked people. Doritos. But the point is, it's not just that, but we're talking ungodly music. We're talking half-naked people. We're talking alcohol. We're talking all those things that the Christian should have part of in the first place. But all that is being displayed in the holy place of God. And if we go back to the tabernacle, the high priest himself had to be holy. They would tie a rope around his ankle, and if those bells ever stopped jingling as he was offering the sacrifice, they assumed that high priest had sinned in his life, and that God struck him down dead. And those priests that were outside the veil would not enter into the holy of holies to get a brother in life, but they would pull him out by the rope. We are in a world, church world today where we have become pleasure, uh, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And it's not just the entertainment. It's not just Super Bowl. But it's everything. If we come down to the lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, that's almost anything. But rather, this is more or less the time frame that we're living in. If someone would please read Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 2. Proverbs 21 and 2, and someone else, Judges 21 and 25. Judges 21, 25, and Proverbs 21 and verse 2. So hold on, Judges. So what was that? The way of every man is in God's eyes? His own eyes. And what does Judges chapter 21, verses 25 tell us about those holy people of God? In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Now let's just back up a second with that verse. It said there was no what in Israel? King. No king. That in itself should have driven our hearts at the uttermost core because was Israel ever meant to have a king? No. What is a king? He's not heavenly, but he would be earthly. He's just a man. Who was supposed to be the king of the Jews? God. He was supposed to be their leader. It was the only group of people that we know in the history of the world, really, that was a actual national group, the Hebrews. They were an established country, established people. And they were supposed to be a theocracy. Their government was supposed to be run by God. God was supposed to be the half top. But Judges doesn't say that God was the top, but they said, we have no king. Where were their eyes? They weren't up there, but they were down here. And when our eyes are on the earth, when they are focused on everything around us, Judges chapter 21, verse 25, as Sister King just read, gave us perfectly the human mindset. When our eyes are fixated on this world, we don't look to God. We look to everything around us. And when we're not looking to God, then who's making the judgment calls in our own lives? We are. When it comes to those hard decisions in life that affect other people, if we're not looking to God, who makes the decisions? Do we see perfectly with 2020 vision? Do we have God's perspective on things? There's a saying that when it comes to uh, disputes and uh, situations, there's this person's perspective, there's person's B perspective, and then there's always God's perspective. But Judges 21 leaves out God's perspective completely. And when we are left on our own, every man does what is right in his own eyes. And that is the generation that we are living in. That is the church world that we're living in. People are no longer looking to God, but we are in the great falling away. We are living in a day of apostasy because people aren't looking to God for direction. They're looking to themselves and everybody else. And when we do that, 
that we do what is right in our own eyes. And our judgment becomes flawed. And because of that, that's how we have Super Bowl Sunday in churches. Let's get more people into church. So how do we do that? Let's show the Super Bowl. Let's reach out. Let's have rock concerts. Let's have um, ungodly news, um, comedians come in. Let's open up the sanctuary for other people. And you know what? Let's just open it all the way. And when we open it up all the way, what happens? We have homosexual pastors. We have homosexual ministers. We have ministers that were once a man but now call themselves a woman. And it just gets all combined. It gets all confusing. Because we are no longer looking to the Word of God. We are no longer going by the Word of God. We are no longer seeking God, is this right or is this wrong? But we're letting society influence us and say, well, you can't judge. You can't judge. Well, you're judging me every single time by the fact that you're saying, I can't judge. You're judging me. But if you make a judgment call and say, well, I don't believe that. Hater! Hater! If you don't view the way that the world does, even though they say you have to be open-minded, they're some of the most closed-minded people that you will ever meet because you don't see things the way they do, and they're doing things that are right in their own life. And we see that bleeding into the church through entertainment. We see that with just a whole... And I'm not saying that we don't love the homosexual. We hate the sin. We can invite them in church. You know what? I'm sure you can have invite all the homosexual uh, homosexuals you want to church. Bring them to church. Get them saved. Get them to hear the word. But don't expect them to be on the platform because they're living in sin. They're not doing right. But they still need to hear the word. They're still going to die and go to hell. We are living in a generation that honestly, as a pastor, as a minister, where do you go when people get a sex change and they change this? Well, what did God create you as in the first place? But it's not just in the views anymore. It's on the platforms. And we're doing it because every man is doing what is right in their own eyes. And genders and things are all messed up. Why? Because we are basing things on what we think and what do, how is our thinking influenced Primarily by, not by what the Bible, by the Word of God, if we're not careful. But the majority of people's um, a lot of their decisions are based upon feeling. What do I feel? What how do I feel about? Well, how do you feel about that? Well, it doesn't matter what I feel about it. What does the Word of God state? That's our go-to source. And we are living in a generation like no other. This will probably be the last point because there's a multitude of points we can hit in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We could go right down the list and be here for hours and hours and hours just looking at the church world. But we are living in a day and age where there's information like no other. If we look at verse 7, the Bible states, and I'm making sure I'm in chapter 3, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. How much information is available to us anymore? I mean, if you go back to the time, I think, of the medieval times, Middle Ages, people had to wait six months for another book to be published. I can't tell you how many seconds it takes for a web page to come up. Information is just so available. We can hop on our computers, we can hop on our cell phones, and within seconds, I can probably have more information at my fingertips than they did in the Middle Ages for months and months and months. If I'm having a hard time going through my concordance, trying to find something, all I have to do is tell Google, hey, a few words out, did write in the own eyes, KJV verse, and it could probably bring me up in seconds. I could probably do more Bible study in a matter of one minute, five minutes, then people back in the age, it probably took them an hour to dig up. There's just that much information, and it's so readily available, it's literally at our fingertips. And the Bible says, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. What's the problem with the majority of the information, if not all the information? on Google, or um, Yahoo, or whoever else you want to use as a search engine. 
their man's opinions is no different than your study Bible for, to the sense that this is the word of God. All this is everybody else's thoughts. This is man knows. When we come to the day and age we're living in, there's a ton of information available, but how much of it is God given? There's only one set of information that's been handed down through the ages that is truly 100% God given. And it's all in that book. We are in a day and age where it's ever able to learn. YouTube's great. Google's great. If I'm ever having trouble with my vehicle or something else in my house, I'll bring up a YouTube video and I'll watch it. And I'll watch it over and over and over. I'll, I'll watch somebody who knows what they're doing. But we can hop on YouTube, Google. We can ever learn. But people are never coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ through all any of it. We are living in that day and age where information is readily available. It's literally in our pockets. More information than we could ever dream. More information than any library could probably hold right now is on Google. And we have it in our pocket. People can learn whatever they want, but they're never coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And as long as we, every man does what is right in their own eyes, as long as every council group does what is right in their own eyes, as long as every pastor does what is right in his or her own eyes, as long as every supposedly born-again Christian who really knows God does what is right in their own eyes, we are ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. All those people that sit in those mega churches, if they're living off of false doctrine, unless the Holy Ghost is dealing with them, they're ever learning, but they're never coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. They're never again rarely ready to enter into heaven. As long as sin is a negative connotation and we're not going to preach it, then people can come to church all they want. But unless they get really get led by the Holy Ghost or somebody else, they're never going to know what it is to experience Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Why? Because we are in the end days. We are during that great falling away. We are during the age of apostasy, where men are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They'll come to a church where they feel good, but man, the moment that they get their toes stepped on, they're never going back there again because they're a bunch of haters. That church should be shut down because they are judgmental and everything else. As long as men are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, they'll never know what it is to have a personal relationship with them, with Jesus Christ. Because they'd rather have a relationship with the world than with God. But the church world as a whole, backing up from your everyday Christian, we have more and more ministers preaching love, 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 but it's never love God. You can't judge people. You can't do this, you can't do that, but they're never preaching our sin and how to get to heaven. And by doing so, sin has crept in. The devil's crept in. There's an old phrase that where God builds a church, the devil builds a cathedral. Why? Because he wants to get a grip on people. He's trying to drag as many people to hell as possible. And we come back to why didn't those people after 9-11 find something in the churches? Because the churches are so far from God anymore. We don't have anything to offer them that's different from the world. The church is to be separated, called out from the world. We are in the world, but we're not of this world. And even though we're living in the great day and age of apostasy and the great fall of the way, man, if we are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, we are not the church of God. Jesus Christ died on the cross for his love. Not because of his own pleasure, but he died for his love. The Bible states, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He did something that I don't even know if I could ever do for my own self. When you sit down, Jesus Christ knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to go through pain and torment. Mm -hmm. It's not that it was hidden from him, and it was a surprise when he got there. He knew it. And still, 
not for the joys of this world, not for the pleasures of this world, but for the joy that was set before him. That joy was a holy, consecrated people that were sold out to him, that were in love with him, not in love with the pleasures of this world. Because what do we know about the sin and the pleasures of this world? Their first season. Their first season. How long does summer last? Not long enough. But yet winter goes on forever. Uh, seasons come and go. How many of us experience fall? At this point, with the temperature changing, some people may even argue that there was no fall. We missed it. Or what about spring? Where was spring this past year? It just seemed like we went from winter and there was summer. Seasons are short. And the pleasures of man are for but a season. We need to make sure that we are a church that are that is in love with God. That we are sold out for Him. That if people come in here, they realize that there's something different. Years and years and years ago, we had a neighbor and she came to Black Lake. And she kept saying over and over one day, there's a spirit in that place. There's a spirit in that place. What was she saying? There's the presence of God in there. People who don't recognize it on a daily basis or even a weekly basis don't always know what they're feeling. But when they come in and they recognize that there's something different, what is that? It's because we've fallen in love with God. We need to make sure, regardless of who the minister is, regardless of what they're saying, regardless of what they're teaching, that we have fallen in love with God. Because they will be held accountable. All those ministers that are allowing homosexuality on the platform, all those ministers that are homosexuals, they're going to have to answer to God. Because his word is black and white. But the reason that things change is because men have become lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And when they do that, we come back to the mindset of judges. There was no king. It's not a matter that we were ruled by God, but there is no king. And when we are looking down here on earth, then, and we're not looking to God, then where are we left to derive our judgment calls from? They have to come from somebody, and nine times out of ten, they're going to come from ourselves. They may be influenced by other people, but then if we have no king, and we love the pleasures of this world, then we're in a church, we are in a church age where everyone's going to do what is right in their own eyes. And when we look at the church world today, for the most part, that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing the day and age of apostasy. And people are not looking to God. They're looking to what makes me feel good. And when they do that, then they are left to, they have to make judgment calls out of their own selves. And Japan's judgment call is flawed. And just to sum it up in the same old, in the old uh, illustration that most of us have heard over and over and over again, there's a gentleman that goes into church for the first time, and he looks like a bum. And the people are all have feathers all ruffled and everything else. And they start telling them, and even the pastor gets up and tells them, and tells them, well, are you sure this is the church for you? Why don't you go and ask God if this is the church is right for you? And the man comes back the next week, and he comes back a little the exact same way. And the pastor said, did you talk to God? Did you see what he said, if, uh, if you should come here or not? Because they're focused on the outside. And the man said, I did. But God said he doesn't know this church. So he didn't know how I should dress. Now, that's the day and age we're living in, in a nutshell. Everyone's doing what is right in their own eyes. Any thoughts, any questions, anything anybody wants to add? If not, we'll be looking at part two of this lesson next week. Let us bow our heads for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, Lord, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires, Lord. 
I pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians as they, as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing. Give them a special blessing as they praise you upon them the string instruments and upon the vocal cords. I anoint the pastor's mind and his lips for today, Lord, as he brings forth your word, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would give him a special blessing as well. Anoint our minds and our hearts to receive the message which you have for us today, Lord. I pray that our heart and our mind will be plowed, that they be good soil for your word to fall, Lord, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives, that we would be transformed even farther into your image. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.